This man is currently behind bars and has been there for over 40 years, but for good reason. From 1962 to 1977, he would commit the same ruthless crime again and again against young, innocent men until he made one big mistake that the police would pick up on and put an end to his madness once and for all. This is the story of Patrick Kearney. On March 13, 1977, in El Segundo, California, a 17-year-old boy named John LeMay left his house at approximately 5.30 p.m. and headed to the city of Redondo Beach, around 10 kilometers from El Segundo. John told his neighbor that he met this guy named Dave at a gym in downtown Los Angeles, around 32 kilometers from El Segundo, and and he was going to meet up with him in Redondo Beach. John's mother, Patricia LeMay, was expecting him to return home later that day, but he didn't. Patricia wasted the following day, but John still hadn't returned home. John never left home for more than a day without telling his mother where he was going, so Patricia knew something was wrong and got very worried, so she contacted the police to report her son missing. At first, the police did not take the report seriously. They assumed this was another one of those teenage runaway cases and John ran away because he was upset or something and like most teenagers in these types of cases he would return eventually and they just brushed it off. After waiting for a few days John still hadn't returned home. The police quickly realized that John wasn't a runaway and Patricia was right. Something was wrong and they began to take this case more seriously. This case occurred in the 70s and this decade was a pretty crazy time for young gay men like John. The gay pride movement had started and gay men across the country were coming together and demanding the same rights and freedoms that straight people have that they have been looking for for many years. Amenities like gay bathhouses and bars surged in popularity and gay men were even having one night stands in public places like bathrooms and parks. The police were told that John went out to meet some guy named Dave and they decided that's where their investigation should begin. It didn't take the police long to find out that Dave was the same name found on the attendance sheets of different gay bathhouses. The police followed up on this and that led them to finding out Dave's address and they went straight to his house. Dave, whose full name was David Hill, was a 34-year-old man that lived with his 37-year-old lover, Patrick Kearney, and they welcomed the police inside of their house. The police questioned the two men about John's disappearance, but they appeared to be completely innocent, and they even seemed to be very calm and concerned for his safety. Despite this, the police took a few of their carpet's fibers to later analyze as parts of their investigation and once they took the fibers they left the house. The police later returned to the house and asked for samples of both David and Patrick's pubic hair as well as samples of their dog's hair. David and Patrick thought this was very strange but they fully cooperated and gave the police what they were looking for and once the police got the samples they left the house yet again. The hair and fibers were analyzed and after the police got the results they they went back to David and Patrick's house, except this time they had a search warrant. The police knocked on the door, but there was no response, so this time they forced themselves inside 
but Patrick and David were not in the house. The police searched the house, seeing if they could find anything, and they did. They found something so horrifying, and upon finding whatever this was, they had a pretty good idea of what happened to John. This is the story of what happened to John LeMay. When John left his house, he headed straight to Redondo Beach to meet Dave, just like what he had told his neighbor. When John arrived at David's house, he was greeted by Patrick, not David. The address that David gave to John was actually the address of Patrick's house, but David still lived with him because they were lovers. When Patrick let John inside of the house, he told him that David wasn't home and to sit down and watch some TV until he returned, and John did exactly that. The reason the police had collected those carpet fibers from Patrick's house was because on March 18th, Five days after John disappeared, they found five trash bags next to a highway in the city of Corona, around 82 kilometers from Redondo Beach. Three of the trash bags were stuffed into an empty 303 liter oil drum while the other two were placed on the ground nearby. The five trash bags were each sealed with nylon tape and under the nylon tapes were carpet fibers, the same carpet fibers that the police had taken from Patrick's house. The police opened the trash bags and inside all five of them were John's remains. It turns out that at some point when John was watching TV, Patrick pulled out a pistol and shot him in the back of his head, killing him on the spot. Patrick then proceeded to dismember John's body, washed his body parts, drained out his blood, stuffed the body parts into five different trash bags, sealed the trash bags using nylon tape, and disposed of them next to that highway. When the police opened the trash bags, they found John's remains, except his head. That was missing, but they were able to identify whose body this was because it had a birthmark, something that John had. When the police entered Patrick's house after getting the search warrant, so this is when Patrick and David were not home, that horrifying thing that they found was a hacksaw with blood and flesh on it, and Patrick used this hacksaw to dismember John's body. The police also found the same kind of trash bags used to dispose of John's remains and the same nylon tape used to seal the bags. As the police were carrying out the search, they went into the bathroom and found nothing, but after a forensic examination was carried out, blood was found all over the bathroom. It just wasn't visible to the naked eye. So what most likely happened was that after shooting John in the back of his head, Patrick brought his body to the bathroom and began dismembering it, washing the body parts, draining out the blood, etc. And in the process of doing all this, he made a big mess, so he tried cleaning the bathroom, but he didn't do a very good job in doing so. The police didn't arrest Patrick and David right after analyzing the carpet fibers and finding out that they were a match to the ones found under the nylon tape on the trash bags, likely because they needed concrete evidence that proved that the two men were responsible for John's murder, so they ended up carrying out two additional searches. After carrying out the third search and finding all this new evidence, a manhunt for Patrick and David David was immediately underway. Patrick and David had fled to El Paso, Texas, around a two-hour flight from Redondo Beach, but it didn't take long for them to decide that they did not want to be fugitives because on July 1st, at around 1.30 p.m., so this was 15 weeks after the police found the trash bags with John's remains inside, Patrick and David walked right into the Riverside County Sheriff's Office in Riverside County, California, went straight to the officer that was behind the counter and pointed at the wall. What Patrick and David were pointing at was a wanted poster of them with their names and photographs clearly visible and they calmly told the officer, 
weird them and they were immediately arrested. If you want to see more videos like this, make sure to leave a like and subscribe. After detaining them, the police questioned Patrick and David about John's murder and Patrick made a shocking confession. John was not the only person he murdered. Patrick was a serial killer who murdered several other young men from 1962 to 1977. The police already suspected that Patrick was involved in several other murders in Southern California that they were investigating, but now he had given them the answers that they were looking for. Patrick carried out his first murder in 1962 when he picked up an unidentified 19 year old hitchhiker on his motorcycle and drove him to some isolated area, shot him in the head just like John and proceeded to essay him. Patrick carried out his second murder in the same year, not long after the first one, and his second victim was an unidentified 16 year old boy that was cousins with the first victim, and Patrick pretty much did the same thing to him that he had done to his cousin. He drove him to the same isolated area, shot him in the head, and essayed him. Patrick confessed to murdering another victim in that same year, but I couldn't find any information on this or whether the bodies of the two cousins were found or not. These two murders went under the radar, but it wasn't until the murder Patrick carried out in 1975 that the official investigation into what is known as the trash bag murders began. Patrick was dubbed the trash bag killer or the freeway killer because he stuffed many of his victims, but not all of them, into trash bags and disposed of them in various locations like deserts and freeways or highways, just like what he had done to John. The reason Patrick liked these kinds of locations was because he believed that no one would find the trash bags there. For instance, fast drivers probably wouldn't have even noticed there were trash bags on the freeway or next to the freeway. And even if they did, no one was really going to stop by and be like, hey, let's take a look at those trash bags. As for the deserts, insects and animals like vultures and crows would start eating the victim's remains and any evidence that someone was murdered would disappear before anyone went into the deserts. Patrick would usually pick up his victims from gay bars or along the freeway as many of them were hitchhikers. As for the murder I was talking about, on April 13, 1975, the remains of a 21-year-old man named Albert Rivera were found on a highway around 26 kilometers east of San Juan Capistrano, California. Albert's body was dismembered and stuffed into several different trash bags, just like John. Patrick murdered at least one more victim, if not more, that same year, and that victim was a 20-year-old man named Larry Walters, and he pretty much met the same face as Albert and John, shot in the head, dismembered, stuffed into trash bags, etc., and his remains were discovered on November 10th. After being interrogated, Patrick brought the police to this apartment complex that he used to live in with David in Culver City, California. When Patrick and the police arrived at the apartment complex, he brought them behind the building and showed them the area where he buried another one of his victims. This victim could not be identified, but his name is believed to be George and was around 16 to 22 years old when he was murdered. Patrick lured George into his car, brought him inside his apartment, shot him in the head, essayed him, dismembered his body, skinned it using an X-Acto knife, and removed the bullet from his head so that it couldn't be traced back to his gun, and buried the dismembered body in that area behind his apartment where he showed the police. Patrick brought the police to this burial site on July 8, 1977, one week after he and David were arrested, but he claimed that he murdered George around Christmas in 
1968. After what he had done to George, Patrick became so paranoid that one day the police would knock on his door and arrest him, so he stopped murdering people. But after waiting for more than a year, he realized that was not going to happen and he had gotten away with murder, so he resumed his killing spree. At some point during the investigation, the police interviewed one of David and Patrick's former neighbors. It's not clear whether this neighbor was from that apartment complex in Culver City or somewhere else where they used to live and the neighbor told the police that she heard gunshots in the neighborhood. The neighbor didn't know where the gunshots were coming from but they were obviously coming from where Patrick and David lived. Had this neighbor known where the gunshots were coming from and contacted the police, Patrick's killing spree probably would have ended much sooner and many of his victims would still be with us today. This may have seemed like a close call, but it was nothing compared to a different incident that Patrick encountered. It's not clear when exactly this occurred, but at some point during Patrick's killing spree, he was driving to a desert to dispose of some trash bags containing another one of his victim's remains, but he suddenly got a flat tire. Patrick pulled over to change the flat tire, but he quickly realized his spare tire was also flat. Patrick had no other choice but to call a tow truck and his car got towed to a service station that was nearby. When the car was brought to the service station, a worker started fixing the tire and all Patrick could do was watch in horror because the trash bags were still inside the car. The worker even asked Patrick, who was extremely nervous at this point, why there were so many trash bags inside the car. But Patrick obviously didn't tell him the truth, he just made something up and once his flat tire was fixed, he got out of the service station. Luckily for Patrick, but unluckily for everyone else, he had just gotten away with murder. The total number of victims that Patrick murdered is unknown, but he had murdered at least 21 people, the vast majority of whom were young men, but some were young children, and Patrick was sentenced to 21 life sentences in prison, one for each murder. As for David, he was not found to be responsible for any of the murders that Patrick carried out and he was subsequently cleared of all charges and released. Patrick is still in prison to this day and he is 83 years old. Thank you for watching today's video. If you enjoyed it, make sure to leave a like, comment down below what you want to see next and subscribe. Until then, see you next time.